morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Wednesday, May 17, and here are some of the stories we're covering. Africa works to broker peace in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. If the UN as a collective cannot persuade Russia to abandon its course or Ukraine to abandon its position, why would South Africa, that has no clout, be able to change the course of history? South Sudanese express mixed viewpoints as their country marks the 40th anniversary of the beginning of the War of Independence. Zimbabwe's gold-backed digital currency hopes to stem devaluation. The IOM helps Nigeria's displaced people prepare for extreme weather. Guinea's FNDC calls for a new nationwide protest today Wednesday despite a military government ban. The opposition and um, its allies are holding a protest match today across Conakry and in the interior of the country to show their anger how the transition is being managed by the junta. And conservationists decry the killing of lions in Kenya that attacked livestock. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. A South African analyst says African countries do not have the clout to bring about a peaceful settlement of Russia's war on Ukraine. This comes as South African President Cyril Ramaphosa announced on Tuesday that Russian President Vladimir Putin and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky have agreed to meet with an African peace delegation in Moscow and Kiev. Professor Sipo Sipe is the former Deputy Vice Chancellor for Institutional Support at the University of Zululand. He tells me that if Ukraine and Russia did not listen to the United Nations Secretary General's call for a ceasefire, it is not likely that they they will listen to Africa. My sense is that uh, Ukraine will agree to anything, just like Russia. All these countries must be seen to be trying to be moving towards peace. They are all trying to win sympathy in the world. And the sympathy is to project themselves as reasonable. So anybody who wants to move into that position of uh, being a mediator will be welcomed. But uh, that will not change the issue of positioning because Russia's interest uh, remains unshakable as well as the issue of uh, Ukraine. So all these talks are actually immaterial. And besides, African countries are a small fry in the whole game, but they're actually being used by both parties as part of the pretending to be more reasonable folks who are the idea of negotiations. But they, if you look at their positions, they can talk to anyone for as long as that person does not interfere with their own interest. So the issue is, will South Africa be able to come up with something that will push Russia to abandon its position? The answer is no. South Africa does not have that much clout. But it is all about positioning. It's all about the spheres of influence. It's all about uh, influencing the world to pretend that uh, we are all open to discussion. Professor, South Africa has repeatedly abstained from our United Nations vote on the war in Ukraine. Therefore, I found this very interesting. What's your view? The UN is supposed to play a role of a mediation. And if the UN as a collective cannot persuade any of the two, why do we think South Africa can actually do that? If the Secretary General of the UN cannot persuade Russia to abandon its course or Ukraine to, to abandon its position, why would South Africa, that has no clout, be able to change the course of history? So that's why I'm saying the position that both are taking is simply to play to the gallery, to simply say, we're the good guys and we're open to talking. But the, what they're not open to is anything that threatens their interest. Exactly so, Professor, because I have been thinking since I read the article, I've been wondering, okay, what nature will any African Union peace arrangement take on the Ukraine war? For example, Africa fought against colonialism. Is it possible or foreseeable that... Uh, African nations would accept any peace process in Ukraine that does not call for withdrawal of uh, Russian forces? No. I mean, uh, first of all, like you indicate, African countries uh, fought against colonialism, but they are still victims and prisoners of colonial empires. 
So if they cannot change the influence of the colonial empires on their own economy, on their own people, how can they actually begin to shape and change issues of world affairs? Professor Sipo Sipe is a political analyst and former deputy vice chancellor for institutional support at the University of Zululand. He was speaking with us from Johannesburg. In Guinea, the National Front for the Defense of the Constitution, also known as FNDC, and the opposition political parties have called for new nationwide protests today Wednesday. This, even though the military junta led by Colonel Mamandi Dumbuya late last week released three members of the FNDC who had been jailed for violating the government's ban on protests. The government dissolved the FNDC last year, accusing it of organizing armed demonstrations and acting like a private militia. Journalists Karim Kamara in the Guinean capital, Conakry, tells me that today's protest is to show FNDC displeasure over the lack of progress in the transition to democratic rule. It is true that um, the opposition and um, its allies are holding a protest march today across Conakry and in the interior of the country to show their anger as does on how the transition is being managed um, by the junta. My understanding is that uh, the military junta this week or last week, released uh, some members of the FNDC that have been jailed. So what is the purpose of the protest? Yes, three of uh, the FNDC activists were released last week by the junta. But this is not all. Some other political prisoners are still in jail under the junta. The, the opposition wants all of them to be released together without any condition. And the opposition also wants to make sure that the ban on political demonstrations across the country is lifted completely by the junta. And also what we want is to make sure that um, the junta is held accountable for all what they've been doing. And that is to see one, they launch investigations into the killings of um, opposition supporters and to launch also investigations into uh, the financial management of um, the country since they came to power. Bring us up to date on the status of the transition negotiation between the military junta and um, the pro-democracy group and political parties. Where are we in the negotiations? The negotiation collapsed in about two weeks ago because the opposition is accusing the junta of not wanting to meet their demands. Their demands, are, as I've, I've mentioned before, uh, that they want all political prisoners under the junta to be released and to make sure that um, bans on political demonstrations across the country are also uh, lifted and that, that um, the junta is held accountable for all what they've been doing. So they want proofs of all this. But none of this, none of this so far been met except the release of um, the three activists of FNDC. And now the opposition is saying that uh, those were the prerequisite for the opening of formal talks. Up till now, there have not been formal talks between um, the opposition and the junta. Again, the opposition is also asking for uh, the presence of ECOWAS and also G5 countries to witness um, the opening of formal talks between the junta and the opposition. But this is what really the junta don't want to hear, that the presence of ECOWAS in the talks with, with, the, with, with the political parties, the junta don't want that. They also don't want to see and then, you know, the G5 countries in their midst so to, be the only, to take part into any talks. They say the talks have to be inter Guineans, so therefore nobody uh, is welcomed. And now the opposition is saying until... The ECOWAS and the G5 countries, and also that their demands are met completely, then they will go back to the negotiating table. So about two days ago, the religious leaders called upon the, the opposition leaders to make sure that they, they asked them to return to the negotiating table. The opposition themselves, in return, asked the religious leaders to go to the government and ask them to meet their demands. So once their demands are met, so they say they will eventually return to the negotiating table and also open formal talks under the open eyes of ECOWAS and the G5 countries. That was journalist Karim Kamara speaking with us from the Guinea capital, Kunakri. Nigerian authorities are warning citizens of intense flooding ahead of this year's rainy season. Typically, Nigeria sees significant rainfall between June and October, and last year the country saw its worst flooding in a decade, which the United Nations has killed more than 600 people and displaced about 1.4 million. The threat of intense rains earlier than expected will be bad for vulnerable communities, the UN says, especially those who are still suffering from the impact of last year's flooding. Timothy Obiezu has this report from Maiduguri. In closely built temporary sheds in northeastern Nigeria's Boza, Borno State, thousands who fled conflict from their homes find shelter and safety. 
The camp is among more than 70 supported by the United Nations International Organization for Migration, or IOM. Last year, severe flooding hit the camp and ravaged many shelters, displacing for a second time some 10,000 people. Here, IOM is constructing drainage canals in the camp ahead of the rainy season. Prestige Murima is IOM's deputy chief of mission. In the camps, they already have so little to themselves. And when the rains come in, as we saw last year, they destroyed essentially everything. Last year's flooding was fueled by unprecedented heavy rainfalls in combination with the release of excess water from Lagdo Dam in northern Cameroon. The National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, said about 600 people were killed and 3 million were affected across 31 out of Nigeria's 36 states. And now, NEMA is warning of a significant risk of heavy flooding across the country in the coming months. Our approach really is to minimize loss because we know for sure they do not have enough resources to do all this for themselves. And they are already in a vulnerable state. So we want to maintain and retain their dignity as much as possible. We encourage the community members themselves to come in and do the work. In addition to drainage canals, IOM is also promoting hygiene and awareness campaigns on the risks of disease outbreaks, especially cholera. Flooding last year triggered a deadly cholera outbreak in the area. Borno State is the most impacted by armed conflict in Nigeria. Millions of displaced people are in staggering need of humanitarian assistance, especially food. In another camp near Nigeria's border with Cameroon, residents like Jennifer Agbajida say they're still facing the impact of last year's floods. She says flood and elephants destroyed our plants and because of that, some of us go to Cameroon to farm to get some money for food. Some others take big risks to go to the bush to get some firewood to sell. UN resident and humanitarian coordinator Mafia Shimali says climate change is to blame and that authorities must improve spending on infrastructure. There is no doubt what we're seeing here is the impact of climate change. And so, of course, there need to be serious investments uh, into uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation measures, um, uh, such as, for example, planting mangroves and bamboos uh, along roads and river, reinforcing river banks. With more publicity and awareness about extreme weather, authorities hope to reduce the impact of flooding in Nigeria this year. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Maiduguri, Borno State. South Sudanese yesterday marked the 40th anniversary of the beginning of their War of Independence. As Demo Silva already reports for VOA from Juba, some citizens have been expressing mixed views about whether the liberation struggle achieved its objectives. Juba resident Sakaria Agwek, a student of economics at the University of Juba, says one great SPLM SPLA achievement worth celebrating is that it has delivered a country, the Republic of South Sudan, and set up necessary institutions. 16 May 1983 was a date that our liberators started the war against the Khartoum regime. The, it was actually a war of uh, marginalization. South Sudan was marginalized by Sudan government, the world is Sudan. It is actually a day that we are very happy as South Sudanese. We feel like we are liberated now. Now we have our country, South Sudan. Uh, we have our own government and all structures of government are in place. But Agwek says, though the war of liberation led to independence, many citizens are disappointed, especially as many believe the country's resources are benefiting only a few individuals. There is a rampant corruption. It is often there is a corruption allegation made by the government official. It is one of the disappointments that uh, I have ever seen. Uh, and uh, second to that, the level of insecurity is very high. Seen there are more rebellion year, yearly, like in 2013, there was a, a pale coup that happened, the same to 2017. So actually, we are disappointed for that war. Another Juba resident, Kwai Majak Gai, says as much as the 40th Independence Day anniversary is significant for remembering those who died during the liberation struggle, the SPLM-SPLA 
has not lived up to the dream of its founders. Why we celebrate this day is because actually uh, we want to know actually how we support about this day and we remember how we actually deal about the, uh, our nation or we liberate our nation. Victor Wani is a resident of Juba's Nyakron residential area and a law student at the University of Juba. He says although South Sudanese have achieved their own country under the SPLM, SPLA, the country is torn apart by tribalism. Why? Because uh, the expectation that they ever expect for them to live as South Sudanese is not there. So for, for, for example, nowadays uh, people are not happy, there is no salary, uh, there is insecurity, there is hatred and all over. Because we are expecting that uh, once we get this freedom, uh, or, uh, we are South Sudanese. So why, why are we still fighting? In response to criticism, Lam Boss, the SPLM Secretary General, told new members of the party on Friday that the party has development programs but cannot implement them while people are fighting the government. We have an objective, we have a program for development. The only problem is us because how do you implement a development program when people are fighting you? And those who are fighting are asking SPLM, why are you not developing the country? How do you develop a country and you are fighting me? Development and war, they don't go together. There were no public celebrations of the 40th SPLM, SPLA anniversary in the capital, Juba. Army spokesperson Major General Lul Rai Kwong posted on his Facebook page, quote, the SSPDF command would like to inform its rank and file as well as the public that there will be no official celebrations to mark the 40th anniversary of inception of the SPLA SSPDF, end quote. For VOA News, I am Dimo Silva Aurelio in Juba. Zimbabwe's central bank on May 8 launched a gold-backed digital currency that it hopes will reduce the demand for U.S. dollars and the devaluation of the Zimbabwe dollar. But analysts say the government-controlled foreign exchange market is fueling the problem. Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare. Zimbabwe's dollar was reintroduced in 2019, but now trades at more than 2,000 to the U.S. dollar on the black market. The government hopes the release of a gold-backed digital currency who reduce the Zimbabwe's dollar rapid devaluation. Mutuli Nguwe is Zimbabwe's Minister of Finance. It's a very positive thing as, as these digital coins, of course, are backed by physical gold in, the, in, the, in our vaults. So it's a very solid uh, instrument. And uh, so anyone buying it should feel comfortable that it's a solid instrument that will preserve value. Companies buying the new digital currency hope it can protect their local currency investments. Farai Gwaka is the general manager of Zimunat Asset Management. We do have quite a sizable amount of local currency uh, investments, uh, especially you know, money market and the like. And we, upon analyzing the proposal from the Reserve Bank, we quickly realize that it's a very useful hedging instrument because it's linked to a hard asset, which is gold. It will protect you in terms of uh, any currency, potential currency devaluation. But in written comments to VOA, the International Monetary Fund's office in Zimbabwe expressed concern about the digital currency and market controls. It said a careful assessment was needed to ensure the benefits of the new currency outweigh the costs and the potential risks. Economists say having enough gold to back the tokens is a concern. Prosper Jitambara is an economist with the Labour and Economic Development Research Institute of Zimbabwe. Oh, on paper, I'm saying that uh, a digital gold currency is actually a sound idea uh, economically. But I think there is need for greater transparency in terms of issues like the reserves, uh, how, much, how, how much reserves we actually have as a country uh, to be able to successfully back and defend uh, these uh, digital gold coins. Zimbabwe State Media in April reported the government had about $23 million in gold and planned to build its reserves to $100 million. Last year, Zimbabwe introduced a physical gold coin to try to stabilize its dollar, but the currency has since dropped to less than a third its value. Analysts say a big problem is Zimbabwe's controls on the currency market, which values 
the local dollar at more than six times the red it trades for on the black market. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Harare, Zimbabwe. Wildlife conservationist in Kenya said the killing of 10 lions in the past week is reversing gains made in efforts to protect the big cat dwindling population. Herders killed the lions after they strayed into villages and attacked livestock and a dog. Experts say more needs to be done to prevent such deadly human life conflict. Victoria Amuga has the story from Nairobi. In two separate incidents last week, herders speared stray lions to death in villages next to Kenya's Amboseli National Park, an occurrence conservationists describe as a blow to efforts to protect the big cats. African wildlife conservation scientist Philip Muruthi says it's crucial to prevent incidents that lead to the deaths of so many lions. There is a time when the lions in Amboseli, the population had really uh, declined. But due to conservation initiatives, the lion population recovered. This sort of incident should not draw back the gains that have been made. There are over 100 lions in that ecosystem, which is a recovery. Yeah, there is a time when they were fewer than that due to conflict. Kenya's game parks are home to an estimated 2,500 lions, according to national data. But researchers say habitat loss and human life conflict are threats to the big cats. Yusuf Wato is the Biodiversity Research and Innovation Manager at the Wildlife Fund in Kenya. The major challenge is uh, the way these protected areas have been designed. They are small. Most times they are not connected. In fact, um, as far as statistics goes, 65% of all the wildlife live outside protected areas on people's land. And that, uh, of course, then causes challenges. A Kenyan Wildlife Service official, Paul Gennaro, told VOA that the state has since increased surveillance around Amboseli to monitor lions' movements. He also said the number of cats killed was likely higher than those discovered in the two villages so far. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi.